And that was brilliant. And it just distills down what the problems are and how do we actually make, make it happen. And I think our mission, Intelligent Health, is all about place. And it's all about making those places fit for people to be able to thrive um, as we've done. We're all trying to do the same thing. So this is our approach and how we've done it. And just as a bit of background, I mean, I'm still a GP, and I started off back in 1990s trying to work out what am I doing giving all these drugs and tablets to people when actually all they need to do is go for a walk, and they never did. And I couldn't work out why they didn't go for a walk. And then I realised that actually they felt frightened going on a walk on their own, so they, the women wanted to go with other women, and the men wanted, didn't want to get lost, so they didn't admit that, of course, but they, we found out that was one of their problems, or getting over a style if they've got arthritis. And all these things started to come along. So we, let, we started led walks and health walks. And when I realised that actually the camaraderie was actually the far bigger medicine than the actual physical activity itself, and then we worked out that actually being out in nature and being out in the environment was even another bigger, another even another, another bigger um, factor about health. And so suddenly, the physical activity was a means of getting people outdoors into nature and a means to get people together. And it all started to make sense. And that journey has carried on um, with Intelligent Health, um, who a few are here, and um, we'll, we'll go through some of our story. And Paul um, from Burnley will kind of make it real at the end of, of this presentation. So we'll... I'll do the kind of some of the theory, but Paul actually knows how to make it happen. And, uh, and in Burnley, it's a great story there. Um, if we look at the World Health Organization, it's just saying about the factors that strengthen our mental health. You can see three different areas there. Um, there's the individual part of us, um, of our attributes and our skills, ourselves. And then it's about the social interaction. And anyone who hasn't read the book, um, The Good Life, which had come from Harvard, have a go at it, because it just says that interaction, social interaction, is now the biggest risk factor for ill health. It's overtaken smoking. Not because there are more people who are lonely. It's because for an individual, being lonely is worse than smoking, 20 cigarettes a day. And they've got the evidence of the longitudinal studies started in 1935, which is one of the longest, and then they pulled all the other longitudinal studies together to come up with this incredible feeling of um, knowledge about social interaction. So no wonder COVID caused problems, you know, afterwards, and it's still causing problems now. So that social interaction. And then as we've been talking about, that safe neighbourhoods, really simple to say, but so complex. And so you've got the person, you've got the environment, and you've also got the community. And we pull that together into what we think is the fundamentals of trying to get to a, a place. And the words in the middle... You know, they could be lots of different words. They're just being plucked out. But if you're doing it in a school, it'd be different to a workplace, to a different to a community. But the big things are, from that WHO, the people bit is the people around us. The purpose is that central part, and then the place. And then from a neuroscience point of view, the body actually only just cares about three things. We talked about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Number one, safe. Everything our body will do to try and make us feel safe. It will also try and make us feel valued. Then we're useful to the little tribe that we're in as a hunter-gatherer. And as we've just heard, belong. And when you pull those together, you start to find, OK, what makes people safe with someone else? Well, it's that love and trust. Trust is a huge factor of safety. What about people when you're feeling valued? You're listened to. You've got friendship. About belonging. It's that tribe. It could be a team, that community, when you can go down. And so you can go down to all of those, and you can start to work out Actually, if we get all of that right, that probably is the absolute core to then move on to well-being and mental health, and then to the physical activity and emotional needs, and then finally to the diseases. So we've been collecting some data, and I think you can probably see that. And we took the people bit and the purpose, and we put questions onto them. I've been feeling optimistic about the future as a hope. I lead a fulfilling life. I share the time with my neighbours. And then we put, in our, um, from when we were doing Beat the Street, and I'll come on to how we collected this, the most deprived communities, and this is the 1,000 people we got this from, um, in a small part of Reading, the over average and then the least deprived. And you can start to see patterns. And if you look at the biggest gap, overall, and it just goes in what Mark was saying, overall I think my neighbourhood is a good place to bring up children. 
zero people in the deprived areas agreed with that. And then almost 60%, well, it's not quite there, but it's on a, a measure on that, felt it was a good place. And they were living a quarter of a mile away from each other, sometimes just up the street. So there's a perception and a reality coming together. But if you look at the friendship connections, everyone agrees that friends are good. And again, it's what Mark has said. In the most deprived areas, it's the friendships that hold people together. That's the asset we can build on. And I like sharing my time with others. The most deprived communities are wanting to share. They're wanting to make the place better. They want to do things good, but they're just stuck with the place. <coughs> I enjoy exploring my neighborhood. Massive gap. Um, and feeling in control of my life, actually not so bad. Now this, you can do to every, what we can do is to almost do every street and look at the difference on every street. And then you can start building to find out where those issues are from the more deprived and the least deprived. And actually then if we look at it from those who had the lowest mental health compared to the highest mental health, it starts to even out. It's like three concentric circles. So you can start to now see the place has less impact now from a deprivation. But what you can see is that purpose part of feeling in control of my life, I've been feeling optimistic about the future, that's massive gap comes out. So people who've got poor mental health feel hopeless. They don't have that wherewithal. But actually, they still feel those friendships are connecting. You know, that's still important. <coughs> this starts to help us understand where those issues are. It starts to help us. Okay, we've got a place where people are feeling really anxious, they're feeling got mental health problems. Okay, that's fine, but we want to know why. And this starts to help us to understand why. So this is some of the data why we're looking at resilience so much more. And yep, because we can go to places we can ask all these questions, we then go to those who've got the most problems on mental health, and we can go into those 10% and start asking them more questions and then introducing them to the community assets that are there or the nature, and this in Reading one we're doing here is, is um, the nature. So you, you can identify by screening a lot of the population, 1,148 children, 1,286 adults in a very small part of Reading. Um, we can start to build up for those who really, really need it. And this is the map of the areas where there's the low percentage, you've got the lowest. We've got a big area there. We've got another area on the left in the west of Reading, and if you go, this is a small part of Reading, these are LSOAs, and right. So what we're trying to do now is understand right down to those individuals where the issues are, and then identify down, almost down to street level where the problems are. And this is a good place to bring up children, it's actually slight reverse, so this is actually a good one, um, the dark, but you can see the paler bits, which are the bad bits, the same, er same areas beginning to come through and we can do it in all these areas. So this is work we're really starting to understand. And the reason is because why are people living in deprived areas iller? Why are they more ill? You, know, you might think, well, it's obvious. Well, is it? If you start with that weak resilience, you then get chronic stress, because if you've got poor resilience, a small stressor will come along and knock you over. You won't recover, which is what we all try and do if we've got good resilience. And then when you move into chronic stress, everything in your body changes. Your immune system changes, the hormones, the cortisol, the adrenaline, and the, it starts to cause problems. It also causes negative emotions. And those negative emotions are actually all good emotions. They're all protective. So anger, fear, anxiety, all of those you might think are really negative, but when you think about it, they're all there to protect you. Fear is to stop you from doing the same thing again. So is anxiety. Depression is a sickness behavior to pull you away from the crowd because people who are sick had to be pulled away from the tribe. So we now know that from some books have been written by the psychiatrist saying that depression is probably just a reaction to that chronic stress. Whoops, got no signal. Yes, we have. <laughs> um, I need to keep moving it, clearly. Um, so those negative emotions aren't necessarily negative. Then you get unhealthy behaviors. They're all protective. Why would you waste calories if you're under stress? Because you might not get any more calories. So don't go to the gym. A waste of calories, that is. Don't start doing exercise when you don't need to, because the exercise as a human being was there to hunt and gather. And if you were in problems, had problems, then you actually wouldn't want to become anxious. So 
people who are chronically stressed don't want to be active because their brain's telling them not to. They also want to eat more because the brain's telling them to do that. So as we go down, this is all logical. This is actually the body trying to tell us to be protective. That's why it's so hard to tell someone to change their behaviour when actually their brain is telling them to do the opposite. And we have to go further upstream to that weak resilience and that chronic stress before we can start getting people active. We have to be in a right science mindset. And then you come to the science, where I could spend hours on this bit, really fascinating, um, mitochondria and all that lot. Um, and then we get to the diseases. And that's me as a GP, clearing up the mess at the end, OK? Hopeless if we're going to have a sustainable system, because that's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And we have to go all the way up. But this time, we're not just stopping at unhealthy behaviours or even the mental health. We're going up even further to that resilience. Um, and that's what we're really trying to understand and try and do. So we do it through a game, Beat the Street. Some of you may have heard of it. Some may not have done. Um, it's been around for about 10 years. It started off as a game to get children initially active and then communities active, but it was very much a game which we measured and said, okay, did it make people active or not? And that was it. And then as we got forward, we realised actually that is not really good in itself because the sustainability may not be right. So we got much more of a community engagement and we got a lot more of the connections and then we started to make it more of a system change. And then we started collecting data to understand it and that data has moved on. Um, and we've done about um, 1.7 million people now in about 170 places. Um, but it's to really bring together and leaders and empower communities to find ways to collaborate and get those shared jam challenges. Um, and these are the areas we've done it with the Sport England partnership, so that's in the last sort of five years. Um, so it's dotted around, clearly this is England, but but got Craig here who's from Scotland, and uh, we've been doing a lot up there as well. And it really is a, it's not kind of an intervention that goes in, it's a tool for to be used as the council or the NHS, whoever it is, wants to use it to change that behaviour. So we can go at scale, so we can get 10% to 15% of the population. Um, we can activate it, we use the gamification to get the children to get the adults very much, and then we get communities on board. We collect lots of data, and then we use that data to feed back, to try and change the place. And it's about engagement, using the behavioural science, insight, social marketing, digital platform, all coming together to help a council, and this is what we hear from Burnley, to make a change on the strategy and how we're doing it. And there is a technology platform to be able to people able to see it live. Because that data I was showing you is live data. The game still hasn't finished on Reading. We're still at it. So we can still reach those people and we can talk to them and we can find out what's going on. So that interaction allows us to get that real good knowledge about what's happening. And we can follow those further forward. And Steve has done lots of work on the ripple effect and the ripple mapping to be able to understand what's actually the cause of some of these problems that have happened and then what's the cause of the solutions from conversations asking the community what they feel just as mark said you know those conversations are absolutely vital to be able to get to those target groups and use that diagnostic ability um, for decision making but it is a game and unashamedly the game is a way of being a neutral way not telling people they've got to exercise more or they've got to lose weight or they've got to do that which i'm always doing it in my general practice but if i uh, if you offer a game people are much more agnostic and they can accept it and particularly when the children are telling you to join the game you've got poor parents who've been up at six o'clock in the morning on a sunday with the children all geared up with their little hats on their bike ready and say come on mum and dad we're going to get some more points that's the mo that's the marketing drive of why a game is, is useful to get that engagement. And we can then just get other people the activities, because we don't have the activities ourselves, we only promote the activities around. <coughs> and the game is that these beatboxes go up on lampposts, they have a card, touch a card, and you move around. And the more you move around, the more points you get. But what we're trying to do is to draw people into places they haven't been to before, community groups, parks, green spaces, canal, we work with the Canal and River Trust, we're working with Natural England to try and get people to really understand what their local area is. And what we do find is that 
we really do manage to get to those areas and those people who are difficult. In fact, in Walsall, 90% of the people were in the bottom 40% of the most deprived communities who took part. And you know, these are the people Mark would be very aware of and very you know, working with. It's not always easy. There's often lack of trust. You saw it in that diagram there. Um, but inactivity, obviously, deprivation, a lot of um, women as well, which is obviously one of the target areas we're trying to get to. And not only that, you've got then every time as a, someone touches the card onto a beatbox, they've got a timestamp and we know all about them from their mental health and their, their resilience and what they're doing. And you can then start to plot them on this is one day in Leicester. And you can see that all of these points there are all telling a story of journeys, who they're going with, with their, with their family, their friends, what's happening, which parks they're going to, what time they're going to the parks, people of diabetes, where they're going, etc. So this, this data helps to really help kind of give it live data rather than just individual. So the strategies which we've aligned to, and we're going to hear from Paul just in a minute about Burnley, and in Merton, Merton is now the borough of sport in London. Anyone from Merton here? Yes, <laughs> the borough of sport. So we helped with doing a beat of street, and I'll just show you in the last few slides there of um, some of the, the ways we were trying to help Merton to, to get to this point where it is everything is geared up for being outdoors and being energetic, and I'd love to hear anything more from it because I think it's been really successful. But if you've got a strategy, what we try and do is beat street and say, okay, what's your strategy? Where are you going? Here it is to help you. You've got all that knowledge, all that data, all that connections, all that places that we can get people to. So this is a map of Merton, and this is the deprivation. So this wasn't ours. This is, comes from the um, ONS. So you can see it's a very much an area of two halves. It's a borough of two halves. You've got the more deprived areas on the east and you've got the affluent Wimbledon um, and the Co Wimbledon Common and all the very nice areas to the west. We then looked at the inactivity for adults and it's east-west. You couldn't be clearer really and that's from 4,777 people responded. Just out of interest active lives gives 497 from that area so we had 10 times as many people active lives and it gives a slightly different it's a slightly higher level of inactivity and we don't know whether that's because active lives perhaps select slightly people who are willing to respond but it is always just slightly higher you look at children's inactivity east west even stronger this time well that's because their brains if you're not happy or if you've got chronic stress your brains are telling you not to be active so there's a bit of that there's obviously a lot of opportunity, a lot of place part as well, and there's all sorts of other areas. That it's not just that. And again, that was 5,000 responses, um, and there hadn't been enough data for the recent one for children there. So it gives a good understanding, and this goes down to LSOA level. And then we looked at the resilience, just looking at the overall resilience, east west again, and we've kind of gathered that now. But if you look down here at Pollard's Hill, where it's a really fairly deprived area, and we go on to the next one about social cohesion, it's about the best social cohesion there is in the entire of Merton. So the people are really connected together. They're really, as, as Mark said, we love this place. It's a great place. I've got friends here. I want to stay here. Engraved in, in other areas, there's really poor social cohesion and poor resilience and deprivation and inactivity. So now you haven't got the, quite that asset to be able to build on, but you've got some really strong assets on there. And actually, the well-being of Pollard's Hill was pretty good as well. We're happy, thanks. <laughs> Go away. <laughs> Go away, you busybodies. You know, we might be overweight, we might be smoking, we might be inactive, but we're happy. We've got a good place. And this is what we have to be so careful of. You know, how, who are we to come and tell people just because they've got a measure there? We have to understand what is the real problem in some of these areas. Um, and, of course, there are. And then if you look at the bo um, a beatbox we've got in the common here, in M M Mitcham Common, 
look at the people using it. They're all from that really deprived area who've got lots of social cohesion, but they're all inactive. That's starting to be a bit strange, and yet the people on the other side were not using it at all. They don't use that park. So that begs a question. Okay, so if we've got a park here and it's being used by one group and not another group, what's going on here? I haven't got the answer, but this is what tends to happen when you start to get data and you start to get down to these levels. So I started with the data and I've ended with some of the data um, because I feel that, yes, of course you have to go out onto the street and you have to talk to people and get it. But the person that is going to really make this come to life is Paul, um, of how this is taken in Burnley. So, Paul, over to you. Thank you, William. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm going to start, if that's all right, with where we are now. So, the slide you can see there, this is, um, this is actually the Beat the Street map for, for Burnley. Um, and, but what we've done, we, we've done two rounds of Beat the Street in Burnley, 2021 and, and earlier this year, 2023. What we wanted to do this year is develop the concept a little bit more that suited the work and the ambitions for us uh, in the town of Burnley. So what we introduced was tree planting. So quite simply, by earning um, points through Beat the Street, people were actually earning points to plant trees later, later in the year. So as you can see there, um, this, this is right up to date. We, we, we're right at the point now where we've um, established tree planting dates for the, for the community right through from next month, right through to, uh, to the end of March. And we've espe especially made sure that we're, we're planting trees in every single ward uh, of Burnley. So we, we, and, and when you think about that, we, we, we quite like this idea because by, by being active, by earning points for their school or their business or their team, by being active for a period of six weeks, they're actually earning points that they will then be able to come back later in the year to plant trees, which actually is good for the environment. It's a sustainable legacy of them being active and also playing the game, but also it's, um, it's a long-lasting uh, benefit to the town as well. Um, so this is, this is a long-term ambition of ours. We're, we're, the ambition is that we bring Beat the Street back in 2025 and 2027 as a minimum, and we'll be continuing to plant plant the trees um, on that. So by the time we get to 2027, there will uh, be, we estimate, around 30,000 new trees planted in Burnley. And those those trees will be going into, you know, th there's quite a few urban locations for these trees as well. Um, so by 2027, uh, through this concept of outdoor town that I'll come, come on to, we will have this long-lasting legacy uh, that's good for the environment and it's a legacy of people being active in their, in their own town. Um, right, so I'll just go uh, back to here. So, out, so Outdoor Town, Outdoor Town is um, developed out, out of Beat the Street for Burnley, to emerge from, from Beat the Street. And when we go back to 2021, the first time that we uh, brought the game to Burnley, it's fair to say that myself and uh, my team members here, who were here today, we were, we were taken aback by the, the scale of the game the, the impact of the game on, on people. It's the, only, it's the only thing that I've been involved in um, over many years where over a period of six weeks you can actually observe it happening. If you, if you walk down the street or, or drive to work or go to school, you can see, you can see people taking part in Beat the Street. That, that took us by surprise. What also took us by surprise is the sheer amount of data that, that comes out of that. And, and not just... You know, in Burnley, I think we had we, we had around six thousand, um, six thousand participation, and, and sorry, six thousand health surveys completed, which, as William said, is is, is way above the active lives um, sample size. But what was really striking to us was people's stories, people's feedback, um, and it was really about just just the really basic things of people starting to get outdoors again. Because if, if you think twenty twenty one, that was we were just coming out of COVID restrictions. The opportunity to get, to, to get outdoors more with their family, with their school friends or, or work colleagues, that, that, that's where the stories came. And we, you know, we, it, Burnley itself has some severely deprived areas and we're aware of some, some people who, um, who for getting on for 12 months had not even left the house, but 
through through Beat the Street, Beat the Street and Outdoor Town. If we can encourage people to go beyond their doorstep, because actually for us, outdoor the outdoors is actually the, the area beyond your doorstep. It's not the great outdoors. It's not it's not climbing mountains. It's it's the for us, Outdoor Town is celebrating and making use of the the spaces that are that are within our town, whether that's the canal tour path, whether it's the parks, um, whether it's your front street. Uh, but if we can, you know, if we, if we can encourage people to to start to venture outdoors and discover the town, which they do through Beat the Street, then we're we're well on the way to um, to taking that next step. Uh, just some statistics that um, that helped us along the way in terms of this identity for outdoor town. You know. Uh, Burnley's an industrial, an ex-industrial town. Despite that, despite its industrial heritage, it's actually two-thirds countryside. Uh, we have six really fantastic parks. Uh, we have the canal tour path. So actually, in terms of, uh, you know, for, for us working in this sector, we know all about the deficits. We, all, we know all about the, the health statistics and the deficit models, but actually if we can turn that upside down and look at a strength-based approach, then actually the outdoors particularly for Burnley, is, is, is that, that strength-based um, approach. Um, this, uh, this final slide from me, really, is just uh, our journey, really, and it starts up at the top, uh, top left, um, and it's the, it, it demonstrates how outdoor town through Beat the Street has, um, has kind of transcended across sectors. So we, it, it, you know, it... Outdoor town is really about, it's not just about physical activity, it's about culture. Um, if you work in education, you can relate to outdoor town. If you work in local authority, you can, work, you can relate to outdoor town. We're now having conversations with the Integrated Care Board um, who are very keen on using the data, the, 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 um, the sheer amount of data from Beat the Street to actually influence their priority ward work over the next few years. Um, and that's not... Uh, you know, the integrated care board is, is across the county, it's, it's across Lancashire, um, particularly for us in, the, in East Lancashire. That's a very interesting piece of work for us going forward. Uh, but as you can see from that slide, it, you know, out, out Beat Street and Outdoor Town are, are tech, that's taking us on a journey into um, the cl climate action, working with people, trying to trying to bring people round to that, uh, to what impact they can actually make by being a little bit a little bit more active. And discovering their what is essentially their own place, um, and hopefully that will lead on to uh, more cultural activity, more physical, more physical activity, more pride of place, which is really important to us as well. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you.